launching point for what uh, things I want to say. Um, as far as the title to you know this message, this sermon that I really didn't have one until John asked me to give it one, and I uh, put it as God's added words to the Scripture. You know, you've got there in Deuteronomy and Revelation, it says no man is to take away the words or add words Amen. to my words. But I reckon since it's God's word, he can add a little bit in there for us. And uh, with that thought, it's kind of what I want to preach on a little bit. But let me pray and I'll get started. My Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for saving somebody like me. Thank you, Lord, for this honor and privilege that I have to stand here and to preach your word. And dear Lord, I need your help. And dear Lord, I pray you take these muddled words that I've got written down, and I pray you have them to make sense. And dear Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit of God would just um, speak through me. I pray you can be exalted, and your word can be exalted. I want to thank you for everything that you do and all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, this Bible is a very remarkable book. I mean, this book explains so many things. I mean, it, it explains the end from the beginning of things. And if people would believe, you know, the prophets and Jesus Christ in this Bible, uh, more than they would believe, no, people will believe Notre Dame. But they won't believe the prophets Man. and what they say. Yeah. And if this world would, would, would believe this Bible, um, then they would understand why we're in this condition that we're in in this world now. Um, but they won't. They, they won't believe in, in this Bible because God's holy and because God has to deal with sin and you have to deal with your own sin and they just don't want to do that. And so the world thinks they can fix their problems by themselves, but it ain't just going to happen. Now, as you read your Bible, <coughs> it's good to pay attention to um, the little things in the Bible, like, you know, the, the therefores and the wherefores. And, you know, the therefores, if you read the Scripture before behind, you know why it's therefore. And it ain't supposed to be funny, but it's there for you to know something. The wherefores in the Bible, they're there so that when you read the verse before or after, it lets you know the reason why it's there for and why it is there. The punctuations in the Bible, they're important. I mean, all the periods, the commas, the semicolons, they are important to the Scripture. There are sometimes a comma can separate 2,000 years of events um, in the scripture. The commas in the Bible. Sometimes they're, um, they're used to, um, they are as the, as the sentence is going along and you have a comma and then you have an insertion of a certain thought comma and then it goes on to, um, um, carries on with its main thought. There in Matthew chapter 10, verse 3, you've got Matthew listing all the disciples there. And as he lists them all by names, and he lists some of their father and stuff, but under his own name, it says Matthew, comma, the publican. Yeah, yeah. And then he goes on to list the other disciples' names. You know, a publican was not a very like person. I mean, they're tax collectors, and nobody likes tax collectors. And many times, tax collectors were uh, cheats, and um, they were disliked and, and hated, and some was even killed. But Matthew added that little phrase about himself in the list of all the apostles. Matthew, comma, the publican, comma, and goes on to list them. Now, so those little things, punctuations are important in the Bible. And so I kind of want to look at a few punctuation marks in the Bible 
And I just want to look at the parentheses. The parentheses, you have a um, um, sentence being stated, and then you have something in parentheses. It's something that is added in there to either add or to explain a thought that goes along with that sentence. These is what I like to call, these are the words that God added to the scripture. If we'll look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, as, as I, I'm going to read four verses here, but I want to let you know ahead of time, I'm going to skip verse 9 and 10. I'm going to read 7, 8, and come down to 11. So just t- kind of follow with me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good works. Verse 11, being enriched, enriched in everything to all bountifulness which calls through us thanksgiving to God. This chapter here, it talks about giving. It talks about it's not just money you give, but, you know, it, the church runs on money. I mean, who pays these light bills? Who pays the water bill? It's up to the people in the congregation to tithe and to give to help keep the ministry of this church open. This church has other ministries. You got the um, TV uh, ministry. Um, you've now got this internet ministry. Um, we have tracks that are, are paid for and, and bought. We support missionaries, and it takes money um, to do these things. Um, and I like the fact that our pastor is on the television. That's a pretty hefty bill um, that, that we support. Yeah, and the one reason why I like it, because I can remember I was out of church backsliding on God and one Monday night before, um, from Monday night football, I was channel surfing, and lo and behold, yeah. there come our pastor preaching. Shocked me. But I began to listen, and God began to work on my heart, saying I knew where I needed to be, and since I wasn't coming to church, the church had to come to me, and God used that. And so God uses ministries um, of the church, and it does take money to do those things. But anyhow, what um, I want to look at here, as this talks about giving, there in verse 9 and 10, it's in parentheses. This is kind of what I like to think that God added a little bit. In verse 9, it says, As it is written, He has dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministered seed to the sower, both ministers bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruit of your righteousness. In giving here, verse 9 is a um, quote from Psalms 112, but verse 10 um, um, Paul added that, and when you read um, we can, in verse 9, you can say, He, Jesus Christ, has dispersed the broad. He has covered the whole world with his grace, and he's given to the poor. We was all poor in spirit, not poor financially, but, and his righteousness remaineth forever. Jesus Christ's righteousness will stand forever. Now, He that ministereth seed to the sower, both ministers bread for your food and multiplies your seed sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness. Now this, um, he that ministers seed to the sower, that's kind of like God 
giving his word the seed to the sower of the word. as just like God giving the preacher a message to preach to people so that message can go out in form of food and bread so that it can multiply your seed sown and so that it can multiply your fruits um, so that you know how to be and multiply your seed and increase your fruit. As our pastor has, you've heard him say that he's not just up here preaching just to fill up time or to make you feel good, but he's preaching the gospel so that the Holy Spirit can put the seed of the word of God, that he can put that bread of life down into your hearts so that you can grow as a Christian and so that you could get saved. Salvation is not the ending point of the gospel. Being Becoming saved or getting saved is not the end of everything. Salvation is just the beginning point that you begin your life. You need to grow as a Christian. Just like as a little baby is born and that mother um, puts that baby out, that mother does not leave that baby there just to survive on its own. That's what many um, things that happens to Christians sometimes, that they're just, they're, they're saved, but there's nobody to feed them. There's nobody that'll nourish them. There's nobody that'll take them and minister them the word and give them the word of God so they know how they might can grow thereby. And the preacher is up here. And any pastor, preacher, evangelist, and you on your job, even as, as you're witnessing, you are giving them something from the word of God that can help them to grow in your Christian life. <coughs> Many times, Christians, they're starving for food. Many saved people probably don't even understand the very basic doctrines of the Bible. Many saved people probably don't even have the foundations to know what it means to be a Christian. The Bible says here that um, um, preachers and, and, and people, they labor in the Word as God gives them a message from above so that he can give it to you so that you can grow and so that you can sow seed, so you can multiply your um, um, fruits. This is what this verse is saying. Now he that ministered seed to the sower both ministers bread for your food and multiply your um, seed sown and to increase the fruit of your righteousness. God is given the message to the man of God so that he can give it to you for the benefit of you growing as a Christian. Now, come on down into chapter 10 of this very same chapter here. I'm going to read verse 1 through 6 and we'll skip verse 4. Now I, Paul, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am bad among you, and being absent am bold towards you. I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present, but that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The people of Corinth thought Paul was just too boisterous in his letters, but he was not that way when he was in person. They did not think that Paul would, could back up his letters um, with, with what he was saying. And some people of the Corinth, uh, people of Corinth, they wanted to show down when Paul would come back and 
They wanted a showdown of words or they wanted a, a, a um, confrontation to occur when Paul comes. But Paul says that we don't walk after the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. Paul is not going to come fighting with fists and swords or as a bully, as someone who is trying to get his way by force. It is do you no good to argue with someone to where you're yelling and screaming back and forth. It, the gospel will not get anywhere that way. But when you look in verse 4, they're in parentheses. Let me start at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. Verse 4, parentheses. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Paul wanted to remind the people of Corinth that the weapons of our warfare is not carnal, but mighty through God. That um, we, as the preacher said last Sunday, that when we pray, we want God to intervene into people's lives to begin to change their will. People need to be saved. People need to get saved even though they don't realize it. And so we need people, we need God to begin to intervene in people's lives so that they can see what needs to be done and needs to be said. People's lives are in eternal damnation if they're not saved. And we need to pray and pray that God would open their eyes, that God would open their hearts, that God would open their ears to hear the gospel. It'll do you no good to believe the latest psychology, philosophical stations of, of, of whatever you think will um, make you feel good. I mean, listening to all the stuff you hear on tape will do you not one bit of good. What will help you is what God says. In context here, he's talking about how that we, through God, we had the power to live as the Lord wants us to live, casting down imaginations and things that exalt themselves above the Lord and to bring in captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit changes your desires. He gives you the power to overcome sin. God will give you grace to overcome things in your life. And how do you do this? Our weapons are not carnal. Our weapons are spiritual through the pulling down of strongholds. There are any sinner is bound by Satan. Um, um, Paul said that, that they are bound by Satan and God has got to get break through that bound that Satan has. And he's able and capable of doing all that without a bit of problems. What it comes down to is that person has to begin to accept it. That person has to begin to realize that there is a God. There is a judgment to come. And that Jesus Christ is the salvation. And that is what we need to do. We need to pray that God can break down these strongholds and so that, that, the, that these chains that have bound people, that God can break those bonds that, and so they can get saved. Now, the next one I want to look at, turn to Galatians chapter 2. Here in Galatians 2, Paul's looking back, telling when he went up into Jerusalem there in Acts chapter 15. And it says there in chapter 2, verse 1, Then 14 years after I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were a reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. 
And because of false brethren, unaware, brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place, subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue in them. But of these who seem to be somewhat, parentheses, come on down, for they whom seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Paul here went up to Jerusalem after 14 years. New Testament Christianity was fairly a new thing there in, in, in the land. And some of those Jews that were bound or that were, had lived so long under the law and they had their traditions, they had their circumcisions, they had their trying to keep the law and those ordinances. And some of those Jews resented Christians for telling people that you don't have to do any of that stuff anymore to be saved or to stay saved. I mean, that was a hard, I mean, that was a hard change of, of, of culture for them. And then here comes Paul. After being saved for 14 years, um, he'd been reading and studying the Old Testament. God revealed to him um, the gospel of the grace of God. He re he, God revealed to him that it doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile, that you're all sinners and all need to be saved. And, and Jesus Christ died for all. And that um, um, Jesus Christ, um, he is the end of the law for all that put their faith in him. And that Jesus Christ will give you the righteousness by faith. All that was revealed to Paul. And so Paul comes in here. And he, um, these people here, they're in Jerusalem. They're used to being um, the circumcision. They're used to all this stuff. All those um, 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 priests and Levites and Pharisees and religious leaders, they were a powerful people. But Paul comes in and says, you just got to trust Jesus Christ. Doing that law will get you nowhere. You can't even do the law. Because you, you break the commandments. And so you can't live by the law because you've already failed. And so Jesus Christ died for your sins, and he's the end of the law. But these people, it says here that they came in unaware to spy out our liberty. But then when you look in verse 6, it says, But these whom seem to be somewhat, parentheses, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. What this means is what I like to think. Paul divorced himself from public opinion. It didn't matter how high a religious leader was. It didn't matter how long he'd been in the ministry. It didn't matter um, how many um, um, prophets or how many um, things they did. Paul said, it don't matter to me. God accepts no person. Yeah. It don't matter your title down here. It don't matter how many abbreviations you have after your name. Everybody needs to be saved. Everybody needs to hear the fact that Jesus Christ is the Savior and he's the only way to go to heaven. Paul said that I am pure this day from the blood of all men. For I've declared unto you the counsel of God. We need people today who will divorce himself from public opinion and be true to the Lord. We don't need to be afraid of what people think of us. It says the fear of man bringeth the snare. Well, don't want to be, say, oh, I don't want to witness because they might think I'm one of them old Christians. Or I shouldn't say these things because they would think I'm a fanatic. We need someone who will not care what the public thinks but knows what the Word of God says and will do what they need to be done um, for the Word of God to be carried out. Frankie, he often testifies that, that 
He didn't like those Christian men coming to his house and bothering him while, and keep asking, asking him, come to church, come to church, when are you going to get saved? He didn't like those men at that time. But those men kept coming back. Those men kept coming back because those men realized that Frankie Riddle was going to hell unless he got saved. And those men were persistent until finally one day Frankie said, I'm, I'll go to church just to shut them up. I will go to church. And the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart, got him saved. And what he used to hate of those men, he now loved those men because those men drug him out of the fire and kept going on and on. Now, imagine, I don't know how many times they came to his house, but imagine the third or fourth time those men came to his, his house. We've been there before. He don't like us coming there. He's busy. He's working night shift. They, he don't want us there. Those men did not, they put aside public opinion and went and got the gospel to someone who needed to be saved. People need to hear the gospel regardless who they are, where they are. I mean, just last week, I had like 30 seconds to witness to that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I mean, who else was going to witness to him? And I had like 30 seconds just to tell him that you must be born again and that Jesus Christ died on that cross for your sin. We are ambassadors Amen. for Christ with the ministry of reconciliation to give to other people so other people should get saved. We should be noted as a, um, I hate to say, um, domineering, pestering fool for Christ, but we need to be a domineering, pestering fool for Christ so people can get saved. And one day when they get saved, you're going to be their friend. Yeah. Now, we need to divorce ourselves from public opinion like Paul and a witness. This ain't going in there beating and banging and yelling and hollering. Because Paul said down here, he said, you know, I you know, witness to some privately lest they should run. I mean, there are some people of reputation, and I hate to, but, you know, you can't just go in there and just beat them over the head with the Bible out in public. You need to let God give them the word of God to them and, and use that. But now, turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 7. Well, Ephesians chapter 4. If I'd have said chapter 7, I'll still be looking for it. Right. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7. We're going to skip verse 9. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he said, he that ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Down to verse 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the, ministry, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Paul here is explaining um, what happened um, because as a result of Christ's resurrection, he ascended up into heaven and he gave gifts to men, to apostles and prophets and um, um, teach pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. These are the gifts and the callings of men to the work into the ministry. But how can he do that? Look at verse 9. This is one of the most, one of my favorite verses, one of the most greatest verses in the Bible to let you know just how far Christ went so that you could be saved. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heaven that he might feel 
all things. Before Christ could ascend into heaven, Jesus Christ, who bore our sins into his body, he had to do something with them. And because Jesus Christ was our perfect substitute, he paid the price 100%. He paid the total price for our sins. He bore the sins into his body, and he died on the cross with our sins in his body. He paid the price of sin. He was buried in a grave. But the moment he took his last breath on that cross, he said, into my hands I commend my spirit. His spirit went back up to the Father, but his soul went right down into the lower parts of the earth, went right down into hell, and he paid our, the price of sin, and he went to hell to, to pay the complete price of the, for that sin, for the sinners. He paid the total cost of our sin. Right. I often wondered, what do you think the devil thought when Jesus showed up there in hell and dumped all the sins of the world right there in the bottom of hell? He probably was speechless, just like every other sinner is going to be speechless when they stand before God. And then Satan had to hand over those keys of death and hell and the grave. And Jesus ascended up out of heaven. I mean, he paid everything that the sinner would have to go through so that we could be saved. No longer. Now it says here that, that um, death is swallowed up in victory and sin as the strength of the law can no longer can, can keep people bound. Jesus Christ paid for our sins and he took the um, keys of death and hell away from the devil and he arose to prove that he is victorious over the grave. Christians should not be afraid of death because Jesus Christ was victorious over death and the grave and because he lives, we can live. The reason why I think so many people want to um, hang around this old world, I mean Christian people, is that we got it too good here. I mean, we got it good. I mean, living indoors, indoor air conditioning, plumbing, water, bathrooms, if you can go get to them. I mean, I mean, people don't, I mean, and trust me, I mean, I see some people die in the hospital. And, and granted, I have not crossed that bridge yet. I'm not close to crossing that bridge that I know of. I mean, my life can be snuffed out at any time. But I'm just saying that people got it too good here. And I like being good down here. I don't want it to get worse. But just imagine if you did not have all the luxuries that we have, how much you'd be looking forward towards heaven. Now, the last one, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. This one here is one of my favorite verses or favorite passage of scripture here. In Hebrews 11 and verse 32. And what more shall, and what shall I more say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, and Jephthah of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed violent in, in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, rise to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had cruel trials of mockings and scourging, yea, moreover, a bond and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and, and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. 
parentheses, of whom the world was not worthy, parentheses. He continues, they wandered in the desert and in mountains and in dens and in caves. You have a list here of people in the Old Testament who lived by faith, trusting in the God of Israel. They trusted that God would deliver them. And they all got deliverance. Some got physical deliverance from things on this earth. But some got, it says they did not want to be delivered because they were looking for a better resurrection. They all got delivered. But maybe some got delivered by, I mean, can you know some folks are so bad in their bodies that they want to die because and be delivered from that body of pain that they have. So they all got delivered. And as you read these, you can go by and you can find names of all of these people, you know, who quenched the violence of fire. You know, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, the woman received their dead. Um, um, Elisha and Elijah raised a, a woman's son um, um, back to life of cruel trials and mockings and scourging and bonds and imprisonment. Jeremiah was in all those. Um, it says they were stoned, and here's this verse, they were sawed asunder. You know, nowhere in this Old Testament is it even written of somebody who was sawed into, but somebody was. The writer of Hebrews, whether he heard about it through past writings or but that name not even mentioned but yet you have others that are, had a wonder in sheepskin and goatskin being destitute and then those parentheses that God added in of whom the world is not worthy you know as the world looks upon Christians they have a poor view of Christians, backwoods, backwards, uneducated. We ain't uneducated. Amen. You know, some of us are, but some of us ain't. But we're not as dumb as what we think. We may not can explain all those $5 words that they send you off to school. And all they do is, is, is teach you words, you know, of, of what things are. But you know what a leg bone is. You don't have to know tibula, fibula, or, you know, humerus or ulnar. That's in your arms, you know. But you don't have to know all them big words, you know. But the world is not worthy for, I mean, for them to look down upon us. God looks down upon us and says, that's my boy right there. Amen. That's my girl. They're Christians. Yes. You see, but the way we live our life down here is because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. People put their faith um, in, in, in the Lord. And however their lives turn out, they know the Lord is in control. These people here in, these, in, in the Hebrews, they would not bow to the world's plan or the world's belief because they knew that this life is not all there is. But they're looking and waiting for a better resurrection. We're looking for a better and eternal home in heaven. I went through tonight. I just kind of wanted to show you some parentheses that are in the Bible. I mean, pay attention to reading the Word of God and, and those little things. They're important. Maybe it's just God's little side note he wanted to add in there. So that we can, can, can know or, or benefit from the meaning thereof. For the feel, if you want to get some song, I know this may not be no barn burner of a message, but this Bible's remarkable. You need to read it, you need to believe it, and you need to put your faith and your trust in what God says. In his word. Let's stand turn page 27. 
can make sure.